If you are not an abolitionist of abortion today, chances are you would not have been an abolitionist of slavery in the past. And if you're wondering, you're like, I don't know. Maybe I would have agreed with the abolitionist even though I didn't agree with any of their theology, philosophy, or morality. No. The name of the lecture is, of course, Abortion and Slavery Are Not the Same Thing. Not the same thing. Well, that's kind of the name of the uh, lecture. It's Abortion and Slavery Are Not the Same Thing, but. But. Abortion and slavery are not the same thing, but. One of the things that I have to say all the time when I'm out there on the Oval or out on Art Walk or anywhere in Norman or anywhere else is people always come up and they say, you can't compare abortion and slavery. Abortion and slavery are not the same thing. And I say, you're right. They're not the same thing. But, as good analogies are, let's think about some things. Reiterate, abortion and slavery, not the same thing. Abolitionists are not saying they're the same thing. But we are saying that there are some similarities. Um... When I'm out here at OU, you know, again, love the University of Oklahoma. Didn't expect that slide to be that big. Wow. Uh, you can really see how badly it's cut out when it's that big. But um, when, I'm out, when I'm out there on the campus, you know, this comes up, and people want to talk about it, and they kind of get fixated on it. So in case you came tonight and you wanted to say something along the line of, you're being racist, um, you can't say abortion and slavery in the same sentence because you're white. Or if you wanted to say this is an invalid um, simile, um, they're not the same thing. I, I, I'm with you. They're not. They're not the same thing. So the more, the more important point to make is the one that's actually on the sign. This is the sign we had out there. I believe this picture is from Monday. Uh, this talk is not sponsored by the Haystack Coffee place, but uh, I have spent a lot of money and drank a lot of church-approved drugs from that um, coffee shop over the last week or so. So there I am standing with my coffee waiting for someone to talk to me and uh, generally waiting for them to tell me that abortion and slavery are not the same thing. And I'm like, yes, that's, that's true. I agree with you. They're not the same thing. Have you noticed I've said that they're not the same thing like six and a half times? So, but what I am saying is that if you are not, this, is, this should be more offensive to you, if you are not an abolitionist of abortion today, chances are you would not have been an abolitionist of slavery in the past. Like, I think the thing is, is that when I say that, or when abolitionists say that, that makes you kind of bristle up and you don't know what to say about it, so you just say something like, you're being racist, abortion and slavery are not the same thing, yada, yada, yada. You're not allowed to say that. Uh, my favorite argument from the past two, two or three weeks is uh, your, ar your whiteness is permeating your argument. Um, well, I apologize. There's, I can't help that. But this is the sign. And a few students have come up to me and said, okay, let me read the sign. What do you mean by the sign? But most, it kind of, glazes, they kind of glaze over and want to talk about something else, 13-year-old girl who's raped and all these kinds of other things, but occasionally we'll get into it. Um, it happens so often, that's why we decided to have this lecture. Say, so let's at least have a lecture, we'll have some students come, we'll put it up online. Other thing is, is uh, whenever we're, we're making this comparison and saying, you wouldn't have been an abolitionist of slavery, that's kind of offensive, but we also hear in response, generally something along the lines of, I feel bad, I don't know who Scott Landway is, but I forgot to, oh well, you know, it's public, Facebook. But um, I forgot to blur you out there, buddy. But how dare you call yourselves abolitionists when you fight for the same cause as the Confederates, slavery. So you hear this sort of thing like, abortion and slavery are not the same thing, unless you're saying that abortion and slavery are the same thing, so the other side does say abortion and slavery are the same thing, um, which is surprising in our culture today because uh, you're not supposed to appropriate other people's pain or suffering or backgrounds and so on and so forth, but apparently people who feel as though they're going to lose their right to terminate the preborn babies are as bad off as chattel slaves. 
But anyway, so let's get into it. The sign that I hold is sometimes kind of offensive. You got the big Negroes for sale at auction on there, kind of takes you back. You think, man, that's shocking. Why'd you put that on the sign? Well, I put that on the sign because the drawing of that is the sign is based off of actual historical drawings, actual historical um, material. And so when I, I, as I said, I drew this and I drew it based on an actual um, drawing that was published by an abolitionist back in the early 19th century. And so they were fighting slavery. And if you go back for those of you who are historians or, you know, you can watch the American Experience on PBS or you can read any number of a thousand books on the topic, um, you'll find that really the concern wasn't as much with slavery. As we say today, we always say like the abolitionist of slavery, always sla slavery, slavery, slavery. But at that period, the thing that was really hotly debated was the fact that in America, it was chattel slavery. So chattel slavery, and just to understand that little, little easy definition, it's just when a human being is rendered as the personal property, chattel of another. So the problem was, and what the abolitionists were trying to do, was they had this um, desire to see human beings not owned by other human beings as though they could be bought and sold, treated like cattle, worked to death. Um, you could do whatever you want with them. So yes, from the period, and this is just a small sampling, you can see in the regular newspapers posted on the, the walls, you know, these were the kind of posters and handbills, bills of sale and so on and so forth. They were just out there in the culture. Public sales where you, would, you could buy slaves or you could buy cattle or you could buy mining tools or you could buy oats and wheat and tobacco, you know, goods. And so sometimes people look at the sign and they're offended and they should be because that's offensive. Selling people is offensive. The abolitionists of slavery were deeply offended. In fact, the most common, you'd think, the, what was the most common illustration from the era, from the period? It was this. It was the slave auction. And the standard trope in the slave auction was usually a sign like my sign. This one says, great bargain, sell of Negroes, horses, cattle, and other property, right? You usually saw a man who has got, had a gavel, uh, frequently in a number of illustrations, there's a number of books written on abolitionist illustration that you can look into, but um, frequently it would be capturing, because they're trying to raise an alarm about how wicked this institution is, it would usually be a man selling a child away from a mother or a wife away from a husband or a husband away from a wife, and it was designed to say, this is what's going on in our country. This is what's going on. You like the cotton. Well, this is how you get it. And so the abolitionists of slavery used art. They used rhetoric. They made propaganda. And this was the common appeal. Slavery destroys the family because it treats people like property. So you had dehumanization, basic, basic um, background justifications for slavery. These weren't really humans. Not humans like us, humans. This was debasing. We treated them like cattle. Um, and it was destructive. Some slaves, you know, had a life expectancy of once they were deep south, if they're in the sugar mines or in the plantations, you know, five, six years, you wore them out. It was easier to buy new slaves um, than to, uh, you know, take care of them. And then after you, ha and after you could no longer buy them from the slave trade, you just bred them. So lots of work written on the dehumanizing, destructive nature of slavery. The abolitionists looked at the thing and they said the whole thing's wrong because it's the dominion of man over man. And for them, as we're gonna see, they believed that God had dominion over man, but man did not have dominion over man. God could decide who lives and dies. God could decide your fate, but man could not decide those things for another man unless there was some kind of specific issue, like breaking laws and that sort of thing. So the slave auction usually had 
in those pictures, you try to capture slaveholders. So this is just to run through the kind of things that's going on in society. This, uh, I believe this illustration is based on something that happened in um, sort of the Maryland area. And um, so got a couple of guys here. So you had slaveholders. You had the people who went to the auctions to buy slaves. They would buy um, women, old women to take care of their kids and cook the food, young women to become those old women and do other things. Terrible, awful, evil things. They also bought hands and worked them and, you know, employed slaves for their benefit, for the benefit of not just their plantations, but the economy. So these people saw themselves as the key to the economy. You had the slave traders. These are people who were directly facilitating meeting the need for slavery um, by selling the folks. And then you had the majority of people in the nation, and they were just the slave tolerators, the slave compromisers, the people that would never own a slave themselves, but they're not going to tell people that they can't sell slaves or they can't buy slaves. So you had the slave compromisers. And compromisers um, did make up a majority of the culture. Sometimes in these debates, you, you get into things and people will say, well, the South, not everybody was a slave trader. Um, no, but the South as well as the North was comprised almost entirely, majority-wise, of people who were willing to tolerate it and just look the other way. Yeah, it's not the best thing. It'll go away in due course, so on and so forth, but we've just got to roll with it for the time being because we're a young empire and we need to become, or we're a young nation, we need to become an empire. So you had these folks um, I won't get in too much detail. I mean, there's a lot of detail in the drawing, but I'm not going to get into too much detail about these guys and why that one in the middle looks like the Lucky Charm character. But there were people of all sorts of um, dispositions, beliefs, and attitudes. People who believed that slavery could be justified in the Bible. People believed, people who didn't really believe in the Bible, but believed that slavery could be justified in Aristotle or David Hume or Ernst Haeckel, or anyone like that. So you had people that were willing to believe and practice slavery and manipulate anything they saw fit to get away with what they were doing because they were not looking at the main persons in this diagram, and that is, of course, the slaves, right? So the man that was walking past the auction block would never buy one, would never sell one, didn't really like it, hoped that everyone was treating their slaves rightly, um, that man said it really wasn't, and, and honestly, just as a side note, there are people like this today, in our world today, that say things like the abolitionists were making, were exaggerating, slavery wasn't so bad, there were all sorts of good masters, it wasn't so bad. Um, you're, you're exaggerating, you abolitionists, that's what you do, you're fanatical ex exaggerators. And so those people say it wasn't so bad and they labor to write books like slavery as it really was. So they're still around today. They're, they're a minority, they're fringe and they have to hide, but they write these books to say that it really wasn't bad because they never really applied the golden rule to the situation and put themselves or their wives or their children on the auction block. So the slaves, the, the, the main group affected the chattel principle, which historians of abolition, historians of slavery talk about, is that there was a chattel principle, there was a fact, there was a reality that not only were the slaves being treated like chattel, but treating the slaves like chattel was debasing and dehumanizing and degrading all of society. It was making all of society care less about humans. It was making us um, rude and base and wicked in all sorts of ways. But it's a lot of money. It's a lot of free help. So this happened in the shadow of steeples. Um, this literal, I have visited the place where Harriet Tubman rescued a family member of hers, the first rescue that she had going back into Maryland after she had run away and returned. Um, the, the slave auction where there's now a plaque saying here's where a slave auction is literally across the street like 20 feet from a church, a steeple. So this went on in the shadow of churches, churches on every corner. Went on 
all over culture. Um, some abolitionists actually said that while many churches themselves would not participate in slavery, it wouldn't be able to exist a single hour if it were not permitted within the church. And so we've got to get into it a little bit, but the first 30 or 40 years of the, after the American Revolution, the big debate that was going on was actually whether or not churches are going to be allowed to give the Lord's Supper to people who have slaves, whether you're allowed to be a member of a church and own slaves, um, and lots of debate and contention. And after 30 or 40 years of that, um, most of the denominations, certainly the ones that had big bodies in the South, said that we're not going to discipline slaveholders. Slaveholding is not a sin. It's biblical, so on and so forth. We'll get back to that. So it happened by permission of the church, and it was sanctioned by the state. It was all done under the covering of laws. You had, we'll get into it more, but you had the Supreme Court ruling in favor of slavery. You had the Constitution of the United States and those who wrote and ratify it being okay with slavery. And you had all the states and from the colonies to the states passing laws in favor of slavery. So that was the primary image is the auction block, the thing that if you, were to, if you were to say, read thousands of pages of abolitionist material and look for the thing that they brought up the most, it was that they were destroying the family and that they were destroying the culture and they were doing something grave against God. Of course, you would also find the brutalness of slavery. Not all, the reality was is not all slave masters were brutal, a great many were, but the greatest brutality was the fact of just owning them. Sometimes slaves would run away from good masters and they would go to Canada and they would uh, freeze their butts off and they'd be like, don't you wish you were back there with your master? And they're like, no, but your master was good. Yeah, but I was a thing. So it was the idea of being owned as property. But that idea of being owned as property debased the slave owners. So I'm, I didn't draw a picture, but just in your mind, if I can put a picture in your mind, the South was crawling with mixed race children who were the children of slaveholders and slave traders, okay? The South was a brothel, as one abolitionist called it. The South was also, um, as slaves ran, more and more slaves ran away and as abolitionists began kind of taking more trips on the Underground Railroad, doing more documentation work, the brutality of slavery became very, very clear. Um, this drawing is actually based off of the, uh, the a famous slave. His name was Gordon. For some reason, he also gets named Peter, but Whipped Peter is the, is the name of the, uh, the, the, the image. But abolitionists would show the brutality of slavery and say, look what they're doing. This man just wanted to be free, wanted not to be a thing, and he was whipped and is scarred, and uh, they photographed him after he had been free. Man fought for the North. Um, but it was brutal. Um, it, was, it was a, a wicked, debasing um, institution. And yes, it was brutal. But for the abolitionist, countering people who would make the argument, like the guy smoking the cigar, the big guy smoking the cigar in the earlier thing, would make the argument, well, the Bible permits a form of slavery. The abolitionists would always say, not this form of slavery, and have to bring up what you're doing. One of the most um, clever, powerful um, uh, uh, arguments to address that actually came in the form of a novel. This is Harriet Beecher Stowe, who, you know, was from a family. She was not raised to be a hardcore abolitionist, but she was an abolitionist. She was becoming an abolitionist. She was studying um, life in the South, and she kept on hearing it wasn't so bad. It wasn't so bad. This is necessary for our economy. This, um, will, come up, this will come to an end gradually. Slaves need to just be Christianized by their masters, so on and so forth. And she said, well, I'm going to write down what this looks like in a book. We're going we're gonna, to, it sells million. This book outsold Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species. It came out the same year. The plays, it was the most um, best-selling book of, of the era, Uncle Tom's Cabin. She looked at the situation 
And she began writing down an account of the slave system that was honest and accurate. And some people like, our, our culture today is so ignorant. They think that Uncle Tom's Cabin is some kind of racist, bad thing. It's, a, it's, it's an awesome book. You should read it. What she does in the book is she says, okay, I'm going to take a slave. I'm going to make him a Christian. I'm going to make his master a Christian. I'm going to set him up real nice. I'm going to have him have good relationships with the kids on the plantation. Everything's going to be fine and good. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to see his master die. His wife fall into financial distress. They'll sell him into slavery. He'll be hounded by a wicked slave trader. He'll be sold. And by the end of the book, he'll be beaten to death. That's Uncle Tom's Cabin. You say, what in the world is going on? It's Harriet Beecher Stowe answering the slavery is not so bad. There could be a good slave master. So fantastic book, can't recommend it um, enough. So Harriet Beecher Stowe, we're getting into it now. Harriet Beecher Stowe is the first abolitionist I've mentioned. You may know of many other abolitionists. You may think of the British abolitionists. You got Thomas Clarkson, William Wilberforce. Uh, you may know of uh, abolitionists who worked on the Underground Railroad, such as Harriet Tubman, or kind of the famous ones, William Lloyd Garrison or Frederick Douglass. They're abolitionists of all types, and they worked. Now, and they weren't actually all just those famous ones. Some of these are kind of famous, um, but this is, a, this is a group of abolitionists. Um, there's actually a, a photo that looks almost exactly like this out here by the bathroom but similar period, I suppose, but groups of people, regular folks, that actually in the midst of all this brutal dehumanization and propertization of human beings said, this is not right, this is not good, we need to do something about it. So who were they and what did they believe and why would I say that if you're not an abolitionist of abortion, you wouldn't have been in this photo? So we're going to get into a little, we're going to go back. We're going to go back a little bit in history. So you have the famous ones, but you have abolitionists of the slave trade. I have a full lecture on this that I've given before. Um, we need to put it up online. But the abolitionists of the slave trade in Britain predate um, the American Revolution. They began their work and they set out to abolish the slave trade. Principally, what was going on in Britain at the time was key to their economy, key to their way of life, key to their supremacy over other nations in the world. Britain was leading in the uh, buying, selling, exporting of slaves, the transatlantic slave trade. So they would go to Africa, warring tribes would sell people to them, they would steal people, they would fight to get people, and the British and other nations would put them on boats and sell them to colonies and plantations, sugar mines, West Indies, and in the Americas. And it was, just like American slavery, it was a brutal, brutal, wicked, dehumanizing um, institution. Yes, you had, uh, you know, you have tons of story, historians writing tons of books. There's a general agreement that was talking about something like 12 to 13 million souls that were actually moved from Africa across the, the Atlantic. So 12 to 13 million, that's men, women, and children captured, sold, enslaved, transported to the Americas to be used as chattel. Um, so it, it began with man stealing and then selling those men for money. And it, 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 it ended up being sort of this, uh, you know, you would pack as many slaves on a ship as you possibly could. You would figure out how many are gonna die of dysentery, how many are gonna die of other things, how many are going to kill themselves, how many are gonna throw themselves overboard. Um, you know, and uh, they would figure all that out and they found that it was perfectly acceptable if somewhere between 10 and 20% of them perished in the, in the transatlantic, um, in the middle passage. So we're talking about just hundreds of thousands, millions of people dying as a result of this. Um, brutal, brutal practices. I always show this picture. It's like, you know, I don't know if it's apocryphal or, or what, but the, the idea that, you know, our modern day fear of sharks and that sharks eat men 
came from the fact that apparently sharks followed the slave ships because they know that all the way across the Atlantic they could be fed. So, as reports of this came back, men like Wilberforce and Clarkson, first Clarkson and others, looked at the slave trade and they said, this is not right what we are doing to these human beings. Yes, they're black. Yes, they're not British. But you cannot do this to them. They are men and brothers. So particularly in Britain, among Quakers and evangelicals that came out of the first great awakening, you had the rise towards the end of the 17th century of an organized anti-slavery movement that was bent on abolishing the slave trade because of how much death and destruction it was uh, enacting on human beings. So they produced this image, the am I not a man and a brother symbol. They put it on their snuff boxes, their pottery, their brooches. They put it everywhere. They put it in their gardens, like British people put it in their gardens, you know, to say, I am an abolitionist. I think these slaves are humans. They're made in the image of God, and they're my neighbors. They're brothers. You can't do this to a brother. We'll get into that a little more deeply, but William Wilberforce, he was the one who became the sort of the parliamentary champion of the whole deal. He was a regular guy. He was a silver spoon in his mouth, rich, um, well-off, well-to-do kind of playboy. And he had been elected to parliament. He went on a, a coach ride with a, uh, 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 an evangelical Christian who was, I believe, the Lucasian professor of math at uh, Cambridge. And uh, that guy evangelized him and uh, William Wilberforce became a Christian. And so William Wilberforce, after becoming a Christian, looking at Parliament and his role there, he said, you know what, I think I'm just, I need to leave and I be, need to be a part of the ministry. But people prevailed upon him and said, no, God has put you in this place because we need a bunch of abolitionists, Thomas Clarkson, Aladwa, Equi, Equiano, excuse me. Like they came to him and said, we do not have someone in Parliament to put forward bills to abolish the slave trade. Will you do it? And he worked it out and he said he believed after much prayer and kind of fighting God on this, he said, God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners. Now at this time, they were looking at their culture and again, debased, wicked, just a culture in rebellion against God in their eyes. And they said, what we're doing to these slaves has something to do with that. We are doing this because we are wicked. And so Wilberforce stayed in Parliament and devoted the rest of his life to the abolition of the slave trade. This caused him to go from being someone who would be prime minister, a very loved, beloved politician, to being a fanatic, a member of a cult. Uh, the, the word they used at that period was sect. He was part of this sect of these evangelical do-gooders that we called saints that lived at Clapham and all they wanted to do was run around and tell people what to do with their bodies and what to do with their property. And these are a bunch of do-gooders. Wilber, William Wilberforce was a do-gooder. He did do many things, lots of reform in lots of areas, but chief among them was the abolition of the slave trade. And he said that if to be feelingly alive to the sufferings of my fellow creatures, again, the man and the brother, is to be a fanatic, I am one of the most incurable fanatics ever permitted to be at large. He just owned it. They called them fanatics, they called them culty, but they owned it. So Wilberforce owned it. Thomas Clarkson, who kind of was one of the men who recruited Wilberforce to the cause, wrote in his two-volume History of the Rise, Progress, and Accomplishment of the Abolition of the Slave Trade by British Parliament, um, wrote the beginning and the middle and the end of that book that the abolition of the slave trade occurred primarily because of one thing, and that was you could not have Christians in a country that did what they were doing without those Christians rising up and seeking to abolish it. There's always been, in all times and countries, a, counteract, a counteracting energy which has opposed itself to the crimes and miseries of mankind. But it seems to have been reserved for Christianity to increase this energy and to give to it the widest possible domain, to cut off many of the causes of wretchedness and to heal it wherever it is found. The book, of course, is filled with all sorts of evidence and science and philosophy and reason and scripture and a complete willingness to say, yes, we are doing this because we're Christians. 
We're fanatical Christians who are trying to abolish the slave trade. And you guys don't like us, but we're going to do what we're going to do. And you can call us whatever names you want. So I could talk about everyone from, you know, the, the old great men of the abolition movement to the younger upstarts to, to slaves who found their freedom and began working in the abolition of the slave trade. But I want to just point out just again that this was a theological movement. This, this, was not, this image was not meant to be a graphic image. This image was meant to be a theological statement. People at the time, at this period, throughout the 17th, 18th century, um, biblical literacy was very high. And the Bible said you could not buy and sell, you could not buy and sell a brother. So they used the word brother. You could not mistreat a man because men are made in the image of God. And of course they used the word men to refer to humanity. So what, how were they treated? Of course, I just have one quote here. It's from uh, Colonel Tarleton, who was a hero of the American Revolutionary War and he was a leader in the um, House of Parliament. And he just, he just looked at Wilberforce and his cohorts and he said that they were just fanatic dreamers. Britain could not abolish the slave trade, no matter how immoral or how outraged. He just couldn't do it. It was a necessity of modern life. Of course, this is a politician who's being supported by slave traders. But I have this whole other lecture where I talk about the entire 20-year campaign, what Wilberforce did, how they stopped him, how they put up different bills to gradually abolish the slave trade instead of immediately abolish the slave trade. Um, you can, we'll get that up online if you want to get into the nitty gritty. But after it was all over, um, and on down to our day, historians, scholars, sociologists, study the abolitionists who did set themselves. We're talking Wilberforce, just Wilberforce. I mean, it happened for decades before Wilberforce. But just Wilberforce, devoting 20 years to basically working himself to death on behalf of the slave. Say, why did these people do it? In the, uh, in the run-up for, for real, real academic-y type people that might see this or be in the room, um, during the heyday of Marxist historiography, you say, why is it that Britain, when slave trade and slavery in the colonies was at its height of economic prowess and importance, why is it then that they abolished it? It's been kind of a mystery. Some historians, secular and Christian, have just said it was just sort of a thing, like it was a moral revolution that Christians did. Now, it can get complex. There's economic, there's moral, there's religious, spiritual, there's everything that's going on. But scholars now, and I put John Coffey up here because he's a, he's a, um, he's a professor at the University of Leicester, but he, he wrote, he wrote a, a paper called Tremble and Fear. And, and I've read it recently, and it's just one that I would recommend for people who uh, don't buy this, what I'm about to say, is that when you study the abolitionists and you say, what was it that made them devote their lives to this? Love of slave, love of their neighbor, and guess what? Love of God. And at the beginning and end of most speeches, letters, sermons, tracts, pamphlets, fear of God. It was a fear of the judgment of God. Like the abolitionists, they were abolishing the slave trade. They stood up and they said, this is evil. You can't do this. It's racist. You're wrong. You're bad. And if we do not do something about this, God will judge us. And that is why these people poured themselves out. They were troubled by the fear that God would chastise an impertinent, an impenitent Britain for trading in African slaves. They were buoyed by the hope that repentance could restore divine favor. They believed that the nation was guilty of a national sin. And they believed that they did not repent of that national sin. And that didn't just mean feel bad about it. That means stop doing it. God would judge them. Historians are starting to look at it now because sometimes people say things like, man, Britain did a better job than America. They abolished slavery without a war. Problem is, is the judgment of God against national sins did in fact come after decades of delaying the abolition of the slave trade 
towards the end before it was abolished. Uh, these are just fantastic books that you can read on this topic if you, if you want to pause it sometime you're looking at the video or whatever. This is all, everything I'm saying is just well documented. You might be sitting there thinking, this seems really preachy because these people were really preachy. Not preachy because that was the language of the time. It's what they literally believed. But the book here in the middle, Rough Crossings, talks about the reality of the judgment of God and against national sins and how that played out. Um, the reality of what happened to the mistreatment of the slaves and the delay is that you can't write a history of the abolition of slavery without talking about the fact that by the time they abolished the trade in Britain, it remained alive and well in the United States of America where they no longer had any kind of political sway. So all well and good, someone might say, the British, they abolished slavery without a bloody revolution, without the judgment of God. I'd actually submit to you, this is one of the things that I'd say that you don't find in the literature because they don't, they don't go this direction. I'd submit to you that there was the judgment of God against Britain and the empire of Britain got whooped by a little bitty upstart set of their colonies across the ocean. And part of that judgment was Britain losing its place. And part of the judgment was the, continue, the continuing um, evil of slavery in the United States. So now it was on to the United States. Now it's their turn. So here we have, um, you know, these paintings. I don't, you know, they got somebody and they're like, hey, everybody, uh, we want you to, to, to just do all the primary colors and just sit in this order. Oh, oh man. That guy apparently wasn't there. <laughs> um, sorry, I cut these slides out really quick sometimes. But, um, but actually, that's true. The Constitutional Convention, um, um, whenever it did happen, not everybody who's in the painting was in the room. Um, but it, their bodies weren't in the room without their heads, so I don't know, sorry about that. But, so of course, before the Constitutional Convention, I don't need to tell anyone about the fact that that didn't happen till later. In 1776, a lot of these same men got together and they declared their independence, and they declared their independence with a document. And then it was only, it was later, 1787, after the war, after everything, that they got together and they had the Constitutional Convention. So here it is, a new nation is starting. Righteousness exalteth a nation. A new nation is starting. And what do they do from the very beginning? They compromise with slavery. I was talking to a young man on our campus uh, last year, and I told him there were three places in the Constitution in the United States of America that compromised with slavery. And of course, one of the other students there told me that was stupid. Um, I was an idiot. Um, and that slavery wasn't in, the comp it wasn't in the Constitution. Well, got a point. The word slavery was not in the Constitution, but that was by design. They wanted to have slavery, but without saying they have slavery. But nonetheless, they did. So here are the three places. Article 1, Section 2. Article 1, Section 9. Article 4, Section 2. You had the three-fifths clause in Article 1, Section 2, basically that um, African slaves in the South will be counted for three-fifths for representation and taxation. Article 1, Section 2 was a ban on the slave trade. So people are like, ooh, that sounds, sounds like the Constitution's an anti-slavery document. It was a ban on the slave trade in 20 years, right? Like wrote it into the Constitution. We will ban slavery or we'll ban the slave trade in 20 years. So... That's slave trade for 20 years, um, for those thinking. Um, and then Article 4, Section 2 was the Fugitive Slave Code. Look it up. It's in, there. it's in the Constitution. If a slave runs away from a slave state for, from a master to a free state to someone else, they're obliged to return the slave. Constitution. So these were, this was the state of the slave trade and slavery at the beginning of uh, in the United States of America. Now, there were people at this juncture early on who said, no, 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 we should not have. These were people, and uh, if you read, this is a fantastic book, doesn't get as much play as it should. 
um, Joseph Moore's Founding Sins, it looks particularly at a group of anti-slavery radicals, uh, covenanters, who actually worked very hard to try to put Christ in the Constitution and abolition in the Constitution. They were, bar they, maybe that guy without a head was, this, was part of them or something. They were barred from the Constitutional Convention. They were kept out. So when people tell you the United States of America was founded as a Christian nation, one little fact, you can, you can learn lots of facts, but one little fact that's problematic with that statement is that there were groups that wanted to put Jesus Christ as king in the Constitution and that slavery is sin and should be abolished in the Constitution, and they were told, no, that's not the kind of nation that we are establishing. Um, so read more about that in Founding Sins. You can also read about it, and there's like a whole plethora of books on Washington um, if you... Uh, if you want to get into, get into it, but essentially most of the founding fathers were both anti-slavery and either slavery tolerant or slaveholders. So if you had like, it's like 25 of 55 of the people there that day actually enslaved people. But so the nation starts out sort of like not having learned and still very much like the Britain that they came from, even though they were uh, saying this is going to be a land of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So um, those other books are just to say that the, at the outset of what I'm saying is not crazy, and it's, it, this is standard historical knowledge. Every single book I checked, every single book that I use is available at Bazell if you want to look them up. But um, the, the nation's highest courts ruled in favor of slavery because they believed that the Constitution was in f favor of slavery and that the whole union was built to compromise and protect slavery, regardless of what the Declaration of Independence said. So, of course, it said, you know, um, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. But chief among that, and sometimes you'll hear life, liberty, and the pursuit of property because happiness and property are apparently the most important thing. Um, and the reason that you could have the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and slaves is because it was part of your happiness. And so the founding fathers also believed, and I would say believed chiefly in the sanctity of private property, which is why they wrote the constitution that they did so many years later. So from 1787 to 1830, you have an incipient, you guys are like, man, this is a lot of history stuff. Yeah, your teacher, you go back and tell your teachers that their PowerPoints suck. Um, but uh, just kidding, don't do that. That's so mean. Gosh. Um, but probably true. No, I don't know. Um, 17, they did when I was here forever ago. I was here before PowerPoint. 1787 to 1830, incipient stages of American abolition. If you look at it, this, and this is, this is a real drive-by history here. From about the um, ratification of the Constitution to 1830, the country could be, in a certain broad brush stroke, divided up into these three groups. You had like straight up pro-slavery people, you had anti-slavery people, and then you had pro-union people. Um, the reason I put it up like this, is, and, and actually want to tell you that really what it was, is you had some who were pro-slavery, like out-and-out pro-slavery racist. You had some who were out-and-out anti-slavery, it's evil, it's a sin. And then the vast majority were just compromisers. Like they actually were pro the union more than they were dealing with either benefiting from slave or getting rid of slave for the glory of God. So as this built up and went on, it went on sanctioned by the laws, sanctioned by the courts, um, it became a massive industry. You'll notice that between 1787 and 1830, America did what the Constitution said, and they abolished the slave trade. Interesting thing, though, we will abolish the slave trade in 20 years. Well, in 20 years, all the slaves that we have from the slave trade will have been having children, and their children will be 20, and we won't really need boats anymore because we'll have lots of great books being written right now by historians basically tracking the slave breeding that went on in the United States of America. Big business. Again, 
a slave auction, selling them like, you know, any good and separating, destroying families. Correcting a couple of uh, uh, big topics real quick. People believe that we once had a south and a north and that the south was a, for slavery and the north was against slavery. The south and the north were both implicated in the crime of chattel slavery and they both benefited from it and they both were cursed from it. In the South, yes, you did have chattel slavery. You had a peculiar institution. You had a set of states that said, we will have the right to do this to slaves in these states. That was in the South. In the North, you had gradual abolition during this period. 1787 to 1830, state after state, slowly, gradually, through regulation and various things, you had gradual abolition, essentially in the states that did not require the same sort of slavery uh, that the, North, the South did. They, that's not where the, the fields were. Um, it's where the textile factories were. So all the cotton that was produced in the South, where it remained legal, um, went to the North, and the North employed all the white people and got on the job. So it was sort of like a compact. The abolitionists back in the day, they said, you know what, we're not really into this whole like South and North. Yes, the South is guilty, but so is the North. So you had gradual abolition. And because of gradual abolition and not total abolition, you had piecemeal state abolition. Because of that, well, you still benefited from slaves. Essentially, jumping the gun for those who aren't reading between the lines. It's like one state having abortion and another state not having an abortion, it being in a, pe a peculiar institution in that state. And if you need an abortion from your pro-life state, you just drive to your, you know, peculiar institution state. Um, of course, you don't have to do that with our modern male. But the North was guilty as well. In the North, though, you had gradual abolitionists and you did have some anti-slavery people, anti-slavery societies. And in this period, you could say there's three groups. There are abolitionists, colonizationists, and pro-slavery people. People in the North that were actually literally for slavery. They, they thought they didn't have a problem with them. There's actually a larger number of Northerners who were pro-slavery than is usually talked about, even though in the North they did not have it there. Um, they, but they were racist and they, they, didn't want, they didn't want slaves coming into their place and competing with jobs. Then you had the colonizationists. Colonizationists were people who were anti-slavery, but they were also anti-black people. So their idea was that we need to get rid of black people. We need to get rid of the Africans. We need to send them back to Africa. So they built up during this period a colonization movement. And a lot of people kind of got involved with that thinking it was anti-slavery. Of course, um, where we're going to be heading, it was not anti-slavery. And then you did have abolitionists. You did have some, I'm not going to talk a lot about them. The fact of the matter is, and all the secondary literature documents this pretty well, even if someone writes a book like, I'm sick and tired of writing books just 1830s on abolitionists, I'm going to write a book about the abolitionists before 1830, uh, half the book is like, man, there just really weren't very many and they were really ineffective. And they had these good ideas, but they got nowhere. But what really happened in this period was the rise of an anti-slavery movement that was committed to gradual abolition, better treatment of the slaves, encouraging slaveholders to choose to emancipate their slaves, and to colonize them. Basically, get them from one country to the other. Don't protect the slaves. Put them in a different country place. Um, and they disagreed with the abolitionists, and the abolitionists, of course, were a minuscule number. In the North and in the South, but in the North, abolitionists, like outright slavery should be totally and immediately abolished, were minuscule. Scholars will say 3% with an asterisk, like maybe. And that's based on like people who went to abolitionist meetings, for instance. Um, churches that said they were abolitionist. Minuscule. The great number of Christians and non-Christians, uh, people in the North were colonizationists. They were anti-slavery, but they 
disagreed with the abolitionist, which is where we're going. Why? Because they did not believe what the abolitionists believed. The abolitionist, um, well, uh, for, just to rep them, because someone's going to be like, well, you didn't mention Samuel Webster. He, he, before even the Constitution was written, he said that the American Revolution, if they don't abolish slavery, it's a crisis of hypocrisy. Um, Samuel Hopkins, guys like him, these are big early leaders that actually said, we, get, we can't do this. It's contrary to the teachings of Christ. You had Benjamin Franklin, very famous guy, uh, started an abolition society in Philadelphia. It was for gradual abolition. Um, Benjamin Rush, gradual abolition, colonization. Anthony Benezet, also gradual abolition, but Anthony Benezet and some others were beginning to develop the idea and start saying, seeing and saying the same thing that the British said, that if we do not abolish this, we will come under the wrath of God. So it's inconsistent with the Christian religion. All of these men said that. Even men who were not themselves professing Christians said the same thing. Uh, John Woolman, he was a Quaker, he was a professing Christian. He said, I looked upon the works of God in this visible creation and an awfulness covered me. My heart was tender and often contrite and a universal love to my fellow creatures increased in me. So there were people like Wilberforce, like Clarkson, like those guys who looked at the slaves and out of love for their fellow man, decided that they needed to do something. Christians, just being Christian. But there were, of course, non-Christians. Thomas Jefferson, deist, which is weird what we think about deist today, like they, a God who made the universe like a clock and then has nothing more to do with it. Well, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, the deist, trembled for his country when he reflected on the fact that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. He knew. He penned the Declaration of Independence. He wrote books and treaties that dealt with slavery. And this actually comes from a letter on slavery where he just admits it. I am worried that we, if we keep doing this, God's going to judge us. I tremble at it. Um, so Christians, non-Christians. So you had at this period primarily outside of those few outliers, gradual abolitionists and colonizationists. They started in 1816, the American Colonization Society. This was a large organization built with the approval of the sort of conservative party in the uh, North and in the South. It had people on both sides of the divide agreeing that slavery was wrong, something needed to be done, but it it wasn't a crime, it wasn't a sin. What we really need to do is we just need to, we need to colonize, we need to Christianize these Africans and then send them back to Africa where they can make the world a better place in Liberia or wherever. And the American Colonization Society had yearly, like Sanctity of Life Sundays. They got permission and they would have yearly services in, in the churches throughout the North and they would gather up money and they would sponsor um, various activities to, to, to pass legislation and to pass projects to help the slaves, help encourage masters to deal less brutally with them, help masters choose to emancipate them and pay them. But there was that third group, and they were the abolitionists who we're talking about. And they were the Bible thumpers. That's right, the abolitionists of slavery, um, in the midst of all this discussion about got to get rid of this, God's going to judge us, maybe, but it's not sin, I don't know what's going on. In the midst of that, in the 1830s, following the Second Great Awakening and a bunch of revivals spreading across the country, tons of young men, generally speaking, planning to be in the ministry, began to read their Bibles and look at the auction blocks and think, this is wrong, we can't do this, and we're going to fall under the judgment of God. And they began to do things like print pamphlets and broad bills and little signs. And they would go out into the streets and they would talk to people on their way to science class. And so this group of abolitionists went out there with these beliefs that not only was slavery a sin, a crying sin and curse upon the nation, but that the colonizationists, the gradual abolitionists, the regulationist, the we want to abolish this, but not yet, we've got to take some time, 
were wrong. They were wrong. They were keeping slavery legal, that the colonizationists were actually pro-slavery. And again, just to make sure you know, colonizationist, the majority abolitionist, the minority. So when you claim, I would be an abolitionist back in the day, maybe you would not. So in the 1830s, what happened a little more specifically? Namely, you did have those revivals. You also had the publication of William Lloyd Garrison's The Liberator. Lots of historians argue about William Lloyd Garrison. Entire books are written about how he wasn't really as important as the earlier books said. Um, and then there's the earlier books and the middle books and books coming out. Now, actually, he might not have been the only one, but what he did in 1830s signaled a shift, a difference, because people had been saying slavery was wrong. They'd been saying that. People had been saying it needed to be removed. They'd been saying that. But people had not been saying the way that we've been fighting slavery is sinful and it is wrong. And our bad, unbiblical way of fighting slavery is the reason that it remains today. So Garrison is a very important figure. Tons of different abolitionists could be quoted as much as I will be quoting Garrison here for the, next, for the, for the conclusion of the talk. But he is representative. He unfurled the banner of total and immediate abolition in the first issue of The Liberator. He said, I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. This is a very famous quote from William Lloyd Garrison. Even non-Bible thumpers are gonna say, William Lloyd Garrison said he's gonna be harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice for the glory of God and according with his higher law. That's the part they don't quote. The other thing they don't tell you is that this comment, harsh as truth, uncompromising as justice, actually is not written against slaveholders but against the gradual abolitionist. So William Lloyd Garrison comes on the scene. His liberator begins to spread. People are, are it's not like a big bestseller. I mean, it's, uh, you know, there are all, all sorts of other publications are more widely read. Um, African Americans, free Africans in the North were primary readers of the liberator. And then these crazy people who picked it up and said, this is, this is true, this is right. In a certain way, Wilberforce acted not alone, but he acted as a prophet. And they set up a number of societies, the New England Anti-Slavery Society. This society is a good picture. That's the Philadelphia Abolition Society for any super nerds in the crowd. But all those people look the same. I'm just kidding. That's so judgmental. Um, like Anthony Fauci down there. How is that? He's like in the bottom left corner. But anyway, so the Declaration of Sentiments that they put together, very beautiful. You can get them on Google. Four things. Chattel slavery was sinful and a criminal institution. Slaves ought to be instantly set free and brought under the protection of law. Instantly, this is what they said. Colonization, uh, the pro-life movement of their time, the sort of gradual abolition movement of their time, was not a good substitute for immediate and total abolition. Uh, the writing on that's kind of bad on my part. They didn't just say it was not a good substitute. They said it was a satanic device. Um, it was a mar plot. You know, it was, a, it, was, it was set up to preserve slavery. Um, and then fourthly, that black Americans should be afforded the same opportunity as white Americans. So they set out, sorry for the long quote and the joyful noise. We shall organize anti-slavery societies, if possible, in every city, town, and village in our land. We shall send forth agents to lift up the voice of remonstrance, of warning, of entreaty, and of rebuke. We shall circulate unsparingly and extensively anti-slavery tracts and periodicals, period. Uh, by the way, did anyone rip down my flyers? Because every time I came out here, they were ripped down but I put them up unsparingly and extensively. We shall enlist the pulpit and the press in the cause of the suffering and the dumb. We shall aim at the purification of the churches from all participation in the guilt of slavery. That's compromising and practicing. We shall encourage the labor of freemen rather than that of slaves by giving preference to their productions. And we shall spare no exertions for means to bring the whole nation to speedy repentance. Declaration of Sentiments, the largest founding abolitionist organization in the United States of America, got their act together, got a lot of people to meet, wrote this down and said, what are we doing? We are going to unsparingly with all of our signs and our pamphlets and our materials and our speeches and our meetings, call the country to repent. 
quickly. We shall cry in trumpet tones night and day, woe to this guilty land, unless she speedily repent of her evil doings, the blood of millions of her sons cries aloud for redress. Immediate emancipation can alone save her from the vengeance of heaven and cancel the debt of ages. So again, like the British abolitionists, they set themselves out into the culture that they believed was a culture of death for their neighbors, decrying this grave evil and saying boldly and unabashedly that there's a debt before Almighty God. For anyone watching this or listening to this that is not particularly religious, you may agree with my sign. Yep, I would not have been an abolitionist of slavery. You got me. So back to the liberator. It ran through the whole period. He shut it down after the 13th Amendment, a little bit after the 13th Amendment was passed. But it got a little fancier. Again, you know, get the art with the slave auction. Um, the liberator kept on going forth. There was a bunch of skirmishes with the abolition movement. You know, different people wouldn't work with other people and they like fought and, you know, oh, I don't want to be a friend with Garrison. He's too harsh as truth and uncompromising as justice and uh, don't like his paper, etc. There's a bunch of uh, interesting stuff that happened from 1830 to, you know, the end of the 1850s. But all throughout that period, the Liberator weekly publishing denunciations of the sin of slavery. I have not yet made it through. I've read about half of them. And the most common thing that you find in the Liberator is the abolitionists of slavery saying that they are the um, the sons and daughters of the Puritans and the abolitionists of slavery comparing themselves to uh, Martin Luther and William Tyndall and the abolitionists of slavery comparing themselves to the prophets, the apostles and the abolitionists of slavery saying, we are following Christ. Every issue. You cannot study the abolition of slavery in America without coming into face, face to face with the reality that these were a bunch of religious, fanatic wackaloons who believed that the justice of God and his law demanded that we abolish this grave evil. Um, that was the final uh, masthead uh, there as, as abolition became a reality. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I came to break the bonds of the oppressor. Christ is the reason that we go from slave auctions and the destruction of the family to good families and a good culture. This is what they believed and this is what they called for. So Garrison does figure into it quite a bit. I have some long quotes. I don't have any clue what time we are at, but it's uh, pretty simple to look at their, you know, this is why you, you see their quotes on, on stuff today because it's all very pithy and it's all very beautiful until I get to the long ones. But our object is to save life, not destroy it. Um, are we... Are we fanatic? Whoa, come back. Are we then fanatics because we cry, do not rob, do not murder? Because we're just being Christians and you're calling us fanatics. Name, by, by, you need to understand the vast majority of people who treated them like fanatics and told them to shut up were themselves professing Christians. Shut up, fanatics. All we're doing is repeating the law of God. Do not rob, do not murder. That's what slavery was. And of course, an avalanche of wrath hurled from the throne of God to crush us into annihilation is coming if we do not remove this curse from our land. They would stand up on the streets and they would, um, encountering, this is going on in the South, but in the North, they would stand up on the streets, sorry, I don't have an image of this, and they would, they would essentially amass small crowds of people and stand and stand there and preach. I do not endorse every street preacher that ends up on this oval. Um, I'm not around them. I don't know how they do it. But when you walk by and you think they're crazy, it has to be what they're saying is crazy, not what they're doing is crazy. Unless you wanna say the abolitionists of slavery were crazy. You get what I'm saying? You following? So why? 
Why did the abolitionists think that the nation was in trouble? Why were we going to fall under the judgment of God? We wrote a constitution. We're a land of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Well, the abolitionists, they looked at it and they said, um, death could not be decreed for a Jewish, like in biblical slavery, when men would say, oh, slavery is biblical. The abolition would be like, okay, in the Old Testament, warring nations, Slavery could be a grace and you could take people in and it was totally different. Let's not get, get too uh, twisted up in it. But we do know the Bible is clear on this, that a Jewish master who killed a slave would also be put to death by his society. That was not how it was in the American South. That was your property. You could put down a slave like you put down a horse because chattel. So they said, got to abolish it. This is not biblical slavery. Slaves must not be, this is a good one, slaves must not be parted from their parents, nor a wife from her husband. Well, that was happening every day. Not just at the auction blocks, but in little secret chambers in master's house. Thou shalt not deliver unto his master the servant which is escaped from his master unto thee. He shall dwell with thee even among you. Thou shalt not oppress him. Deuteronomy 23, 15 through 16. This is literally the opposite of that article in the Constitution. If a slave runs away from their master to you, you have to return them. In the law of God, you shall not return them. You shall let them stay with you. So the Christian abolitionists were just saying, guys, this is unbiblical, this is wicked. God said, those who practice these things, woe to you, woe to this nation. It is against his law. And probably most emphatically and controversially, they pointed out that Deuteronomy 24, 7 said that if a man is caught stealing one of his brothers, whether he treats him as a slave or sells him, the kidnapper must die. So you must purge the evil among you. It was a capital crime. Selling people that were stolen would put you to death in a biblical law. Now, I know a lot of people hate God's law and the death penalty. But for these abolitionists, if you're considering whether you would have been an abolitionist of slavery, you go that far. John Quincy Adams, not fully an abolitionist, basically told Garrison, you better stop calling it man-stealing. You call it man-stealing, you're basically saying that all these people need to be criminalized and like tried for murder and put on. And Garrison is like, your terms are acceptable or whatever, you know? (laughs) Like, uh, just, just, I mean, just what in the world? Like John Quincy Adams, like the great moderator. Like, he's like, you need to just chill out with this man stealing stuff. Um, uh, you're, making, you're making us nervous. And he's like, sorry, harsh is truth. Uncompromising is justice. Who's justice? The justice of God. It is a crime and it should be treated like crime. In the Declaration of Sentiments, they said, man stealing is a capital crime. But what is that to us? We just say, go and sin no more. They said what it was, and then they besieged people to repent. So back to Garrison, just in conclusion. Come on, get it, get it together. Whew. You might be bringing it up. I don't, I, I don't know if I'm going to read these long quotes here, but I'm going to put it up here for those who want to pause it and look at it later. Because some people would say that, but wait, weren't all those slaveholders in the South using the Bible to justify what they're doing? The answer is yes. They were using the Bible to justify what they were doing. But no book did Garrison turn to and appeal to more effectively than the word of God. Because what he said was they were grievously perverting the Bible. All through the abolitionist literature is a discussion of what the Bible really says. Because for these people, abolitionists, primarily, it mattered. Garrison said, take away the Bible and our warfare with oppression and infidelity and intemperance and impurity and crime is at an end. Our weapons are wrested away. Our foundation is removed. We have no authority to speak and no courage to act. If what the Bible says is true, we really can say that slavery is evil. We really can. And we can step out there in providence and expecting God to help us. We can do this. But if that stuff's not true... We have no argument, right? That's what abolitionists today say as well about abortion. 
Um, so biblical foundations for these folks. At the beginning of thoughts on African colonization, this is the very first, this is the ver very first thing that, I was gonna read it, but I'm probably behind. Um, it's on Google Books, you can read it. Look at the preface of thoughts on African colonization. This is the book that Garrison said, all right, we gotta change some stuff. Um, I believe, he, he, I'm paraphrasing, he says, I believe that the destruction of slavery requires the destruction of the colonization anti-slavery gradual movement. And in the preface of this book, ah, maybe I will read it, dang it. In the preface, he says, I dedicate this work to my countrymen in whose intelligence, magnanimity, and humanity I place the utmost reliance, although they have long suffered themselves to be swayed by a prejudice as unmanly as it is wicked and have departed widely from the golden rule of the gospel in their treatment of the people of color, to suppose that they will always be despisers and persecutors of this unfortunate class is, in my opinion, in my opinion to libel their character. That's just very flowery language for saying, I'm writing this book because I believe that all you colonization gradual abolitionists can repent of your compromises with slavery and become abolitionist. And he really thought that it would happen. He also, throughout the book, said that's where the quote about an avalanche of God's wrath is upon us. He explains that it was not on account of the complexion of uh, the race of people that he was seeking to help that he espoused the cause, but because this is, actually this is Garrison speaking to a group of um, African Americans after emancipation. But because you were the children of a common father, created in the same divine image, having the same inalienable rights, and as much entitled to liberty as the proudest slaveholder that ever worked, walked on the earth. Golden rule, image of God, this is what we have to do because that's what God demands. In the Liberator, we profess to be Christians. As I read this, I'm getting close to the end here. My sign that says, you probably would not have been an abolitionist of slavery. This is William Lloyd Garrison speaking on behalf of all the abolitionists of slavery. And yes, you can find a few here and there that may have been you know, not as Christian or not as religious, but according to all the secondary literature, they were such an insane minority that it's not even worth uh, talking about except to, exceptions to the rule. The rule. We profess to be Christians. Christianity, its object is to redeem, not to enslave men. Christ is our redeemer. I believe in him. He leads the anti-slavery cause and always has led it. The gospel is the gospel of freedom and any man claiming to be a Christian and to have within him the same mind that was in Christ Jesus and yet dares to hold his fellow man in bondage as a mere piece of perishable property is recreant to all the principles and obligations of Christianity. Any Christian who is not an abolitionist is not being Christian. The abolitionists, we are Christians. So, one of one blood, documents it, all on fire. Great, fan, fantastic book. You gotta buy one book that I talk about this whole, it's a, it's a brick, it's a brick of a book, but it's great. Henry Meyer, the late, great Henry Meyer, wrote in the preface of this book, he said, I was tasked to write a biography of William Lloyd Garrison, but I was really worried about it because I, I didn't know if I could stand to be in the presence of uh, such a lunatic. And I didn't think I could understand how he was so angry and so harsh and so all this kind of thing. But then after studying him, I just realized, and it's in the preface, I should, have, I should have written it out and read it to you, but he basically says, once I started thinking, oh, this guy's just the most hardcore Christian and that's what's going on with him. He was raised this way and he's just being what Christians say they need to be. He began to understand why Garrison was the way he was. Uh, great book, great preface. Gregarious saints, holy warriors, and a plethora of sins written by both liberal to more liberal scholars, basically documenting that abolitionists of slavery had one primary goal, and that was to remove slavery by repentance of the people, turning them back to God and his word. So representing then that phase of abolition, which is the most contemned to the suppression of which the means and forces of the church and the state are most actively directed, I am here to defend it against all its assailants all, as the highest expediency, 
the soundest philosophy, the noblest patriotism, the broadest philanthropy, and the best religion extant. To denounce it as fanatical, disorganizing, reckless of consequences, bitter and irreverent in spirit, infidelity, infidel in heart, deaf alike to the suggestions of reason and the warnings of history, is to call good evil and evil good, to put darkness for light and light for darkness, to insist that Barabbas is better than Jesus, to cover with infamy the memories of patriarchs and prophets, apostles and martyrs, and to inaugurate Satan as the God of the universe. I'm just kidding. William Lloyd Garrison didn't write that. I wrote that. I'm just kidding. William Lloyd Garrison wrote that, but I wish I wrote that. Because this is what I believe. This is what abolitionists of abortion believe. And this is what we hear. Look in the little bit here in the middle here. Denounce it as disorganizing and reckless of consequences. Reckless of consequences. Primary thing abolitionist, and I'm almost done. Primary thing abolitionists heard when they went out there and said, we need to immediately and totally abolish slavery. You know what they heard? These slaves are actually better off slaves. They're better off slaves. What else they also heard? It would actually be bad for the rest of culture. Who's going to take care of all these freed slaves? Reckless. From the gradual abolitionist. They said, I'm with you, but it must be done over time. And we need to educate people and we need to do something, we need to do something with racism. Let's abolish slavery after we've gotten rid of racism. Geniuses, right? It was all basically one thing after another. Total and immediate abolition is insane craziness. And the abolitionists, the abolitionists retorted, well, guess what? We never do good that evil may come. We don't put darkness for light. You're saying you want Barabbas. We want Jesus. For those of you who don't know that in Bible, you know, whenever Pontius Pilate put up, you know, they they said, we want Barabbas. It's covering with infamy um, just everything that is the background and foundation of Christianity for these folks. And to basically compromise and tolerate and not abolish slavery would to say that Christ is not king but Satan is the God of the universe. So for those who do not read between all of the lines and you're wondering, I thought this guy was going to talk about abortion. I've been talking about abortion the whole time. Okay. There I am. Wishing I had that coffee now. (laughs) If you are not an abolitionist of abortion today, chances are, you would not have been an abolitionist of slavery in the past. And if you're wondering, you're like, I don't know. Maybe I would have agreed with the abolitionist, even though I didn't agree with any of their theology, philosophy, or morality. No. If you did not believe that man was made in the image of God and that God hated countries that mistreated human beings, if you don't believe that now, What makes you think you would have believed it then? I'm not here to call you a racist, but I am here to say, before you start saying that you're an abolitionist, you should know what it was that the abolitionists believe and why they did what they did. People don't like it, but you have the earlier age and the earlier evil. And today, a different age and a different evil. You know why we say that abortion is evil? You know why we say that it must be abolished? Because they're made in the image of God. That God says, do not murder. That countries and cultures that shed innocent blood, God will turn his face away from them and that they will be judged. And while they are doing this thing to these human beings, not only are they dehumanizing and destroying and debasing them, but they're dehumanizing themselves and debasing themselves and destroying themselves. So the call of the abolitionist then and the call of the abolitionist today 
is again, repent speedily, get right, stop doing this for the love of your neighbor and for the love of your God. One last thing you might be thinking, I don't know, I would have been an abolitionist of slavery back then. Well, if you, when you saw that I was giving this lecture at this university, saw a poster, which I don't, I, I'm looking at the crowd right now. I don't think any of the people at toured, I think they're all at a different talk. Um, they didn't want to end up on our YouTube or TikTok, I don't know. Um, if you saw the posters, or you saw that we had it on Meacham, had it at Meacham, and you thought, that's an outrage. An abolitionist of the most revolting character is among you, exciting the feelings of the North against the South, a seditious lecture is to be delivered this evening? If that's what you thought, not only would you not have been an abolitionist, you actually would have been an anti-abolitionist then as you are now. And I'm done. Finished. <laughs> <laughs>